Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. One of the funniest, smartest, and most fascinating movie careers in the last four decades has been Matt Dillon's. From Teenage Bad Boys to Noir Lover Boys, Drugstore Cowboys, Hilariously Sleevy Private Detectives, and now, in maybe his best performance to date, a serial killer. In Lars von Trier's new disturbing and disturbingly funny, the house that Jack built, Dillon plays, well, he plays Jack. Let's take a look. Matt Dillon, everybody! The great Matt Dillon! Hey. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, no, it's great to be here. Congratulations be here. on the movie. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun making it, believe it or not, <laughs> in spite of what... It's a shocker. I mean, it's a disturbing <laughs> movie. It's about a serial killer, but it, it is kind of a fun movie in its own weird, sick way. You get the sense that the, you and Lars had a pretty good time. Oh, yeah, we had, we had <clears throat> a pretty good time in a weird, sick way. No... <clears throat> No, we did have a good time. It was a, the atmosphere on the set was very creative, and um, it was the subject matters d dark, but that wasn't the 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 vibe on the on the set. Um, a lot of the way that Lars shoots his scenes, it seems like he's doing a lot of takes. He's throwing a lot of ideas out. Um, was that a way that you were used to working? Had you ever worked that way before? Well, in in this. Particular, you know, we talked a little bit about because I hadn't worked with him before, and but we talked a little bit about the way that, and he talked a little bit about the way he liked to work, and that he uh, would shoot from a lot of different uh, angles and keep it real loose. Uh, we we didn't rehearse. We never rehearsed. Not once did we rehearse. So that was very interesting because usually if if we're told by the director, let's shoot the rehearsal, it's usually a bad sign. It means they're in a hurry or something. But here it was really a kind of philosophical way of working. It was the idea of like, let's see what happens. And that was great for me because it kept me out of my own, out of my own head, my own ideas. Sometimes it's better to, to embrace the mistakes that come along. And, uh, you know, we're not deliberately trying to make mistakes, but we're willing to take chances and potentially fail. And I think that's an important part of the process, which was foreign to me. It was not a way, it was a really, it was a good, it was an eye opener and something worth taking in the future. You know, uh, as a fan of your work, going back to, you know, drugstore or even, even before that with The Outsiders, you've had a, a lot of roles throughout your career. And what I love about this is that it felt like it gave you the chance to kind of take all of those things that you've played and put them into one character, mm -hmm. where Jack is kind of always playing a part in a lot of his mm -hmm. scenes, whether he's trying to lure someone or he's playing a weird part for himself or he thinks he is something that he's not you get all of these variations of what you've been good at for so many years. Did you ever see it that way, that this was kind of the culmination of a lot of your performances? No, to be honest with you, I never really thought about <clears throat> past performances until somebody mentioned, wow, that guy who, who knocks on the door and tries to pretend to be a policeman and then he tries to sell insurance to the woman was a lot like the character you played in Something About Mary. Yeah, that was me. I said that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It was you, Ricky. <laughs> Ricky and I are old buddies. We've, we've been down this road before. I said that four times that night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You were the one who said that. That's exactly right, when we went around to the things. And, and I hadn't really thought of it that way, but you're right. It really is that. But for me, um, one of the things I discussed and we talked about early before we started shooting was the idea that Jack is many things. And he's many things because there is no sense of self at the core because he is a psychopath and he lacks any empathy whatsoever. So he has to become different people. You know, he is only that thing for which that gets him what he wants in that moment. Precisely. There is nothing beneath that. Exactly, exactly. Wow. And they, you know, actors oftentimes say that they can't judge the parts that they're playing and that they have to find the core of the character to, to, to play them, find what they in their heart want. Was that, did that make this difficult for you since you, as you just said, you knew he didn't really want anything in his core, or do you just play it scene by scene then? Well, you know, the director is very specific. In this film, um, I mean, I asked Lars from the very beginning, it's not a subject matter. Serial killers is not something that I'm that interested in. Thank God. I'm <laughs> typically that interested in, but and I asked him, why do you want to do a film about this guy? And he said, 
goes, this is the character closest to myself. <laughs> but he said, but except I don't kill people, you know. And um, so and, and looking at the character, like one of the things that we did in breaking down Jack, because it takes place over, uh, I don't know, 17 years? I forget. Uh, 12, 17 years. It takes place over a period of time. And we see him at different phases in his life. And in the beginning, he's he's so uh, uh, buttoned down, so uptight, really, and and the obsessive compulsive. He's in full bloom, and but as he, as the with the escalation of his career, if you will, as a criminal, and um, we we begin to see him really change and morph and, be, and unravel and uh, become. And like the mania gets to him, and so by the end, he's just a very different person that you see in the in the beginning of the film. Well, that's and yeah, and that kind of goes back to this idea of you getting to play uh, variations on uh, some of the parts that you've played before, where we get this kind of obsessive compulsive person on the uh, on the porch of one of his victims, who's constantly coming up with different ridiculous lies for who he is to get in. To this guy who's with Riley Keough, who is in some ways kind of a bad boy and thinks of himself as a hot shot in that room and is seducing this woman until he's not doing any of that in the, anymore in that scene. And he's just yeah. going wild. Do you So do you just approach each scene as like, he is this in this moment? Yeah, I mean, he becomes many different things, many different people, you know, at different times. And even in that sequence with Riley, he talks about... He talks about how he, you know, would use a crutch because it was a good way to uh, elicit empathy, empathy from someone and get them to help you because you have a crutch and then you can get them in the car, you know. So um, he also has this incredible monologue in that scene where he talks about how he's the victim, hmm. that like he women are the oppressors and he's the victim. While meanwhile he has her tied up and yeah. is about to kill her. It shows right. this man who's just like has such a deranged sociopathic view of the world. He can only view it from his, from, from his perspective. Yeah, and I think it's important to realize that the filmmaker is very aware of that. Yeah. The irony of this guy saying, why is it that, you know, men are the victims and, you know, we're always, and, and meanwhile, yeah. I mean, look at the situation he's in. He's about to murder this woman. And, and, and so it's, you know, anybody that thinks that that's coming from the filmmaker is misguided because it's really, he's putting these viewpoints in the various characters that he's creating. Yeah, I've been very happy. To, when I saw the film, I was worried that that would be misunderstood that way, that the irony would be lost. But I've been very happy to see, since it's been screened a lot, that people are really getting the irony of yeah, that thank scene. thank God. Yeah, thank otherwise God. it would be, there'd be hell to yeah. pay, I think. But thankfully, they're mm. getting it. Um, with Lars, you know, since he said this character is the closest thing to me, did you ever think that you were playing a version of him at times in the movie? Or Well, there are, there are some traits. Like, for example, the character of Jack is uh, obsessive-compulsive, so... He um, he actually says, I can't even sleep on a bed if it's got a crease in it, you know? It's like everything has to be, if the sheet is, like, wrinkled even a little bit. And, and I think that Lars has a little bit of that in himself. In fact, he came up to me on the set. I don't think a little bit. I think a lot of that is in himself. So when we were doing the scene where I had to be cleaning up the crime scene, even though there's no blood there's nothing there and jack is obsessed and he keeps going and i think you know and laura said you don't know how close this is to my life you know <laughs> so i think there is an element that you're playing that i'm playing <laughs> lars but i think also those are the things that make the audience feel complicit in the story which i think is important for this type of film to get you inside of Jack's mind, meaning like, for example, there's a scene where he can't extract himself from the crime scene because his obsessive complaint keeps going back to clean up something that isn't there. And even when the sirens are coming, he can't. And, and I think that builds the tension, but it also, I think we can all identify with a little bit with like, did I leave the light on? Yeah. Did I forget my keys? Except this guy's doing it in, in, in a situation where he's just murdered somebody, you know. But somehow, 
it kind of tricks our thinking, you know. Well, there's an element. The movie is consistently tricking our thinking with tone, where you're in the midst of something horrifying, mm. yet Lars and you have a kind of slapstick wink in in a mo in a totally unexpected moment. And I think that has a lot to do with how far gone the character is mm. at times. Did yeah. you guys ever talk about the humor of the scenes, or did you just sort of feel like it was in the writing and let it play out that way? I think it was more about keeping it honest and real. And and I think that's what... I think sometimes... If the, look, the, the violence that's in this film, it's not more graphic than anything, in fact, than what you'd see on television today. I mean... I it's less, less so. exploitative than what I see on television. Right, absolutely. And I think and I think what's disturbing about it is what he wants to be disturbing about it, which he's right to want it to be, which is violence is uh it's disturbing. It should be. It shouldn't be uh, uh glorified in the way that it is. And if and that's his choice to show it that way, and I respect that choice, you know. The scene that you have with uh, Riley Keough that we were just talking about, I think you have said that that was your hardest scene to, to shoot, right? Was mm -hmm. that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's a, it's a difficult scene because, um, well, because the character has zero empathy. And I do have empathy. And, <laughs> so, and I have a wonderful actress that I'm working opposite. You know, Riley's a great actress. So when she's terrified... It's hard for me to not not want to tell her you have nothing to be afraid of when that's the opposite of what Jack wants. So it was hard. It was challenging, you know, to kind of turn that part of myself off. And I think what troubled me about doing the scene before we did it was because it's not just that he, the violence or that he murders her, but it's more the psychological game that he plays with her, you know. Um, this isn't the first time that you've played, for lack of a better word, a, a jerk. Uh, maybe this Jack guy, is a little I think bit he's further. Beyond yeah, that. He's beyond jerk this a little bit. I one time said to Lars, I said, I, you know, I said, Lars, I think this character is, this, this is a really, really bad guy. And he looked at me like, you can't get worse than this guy. <laughs> you can't get worse than Jack. You know? Do you ever worry about audiences' responses to you as an actor or you as a person that they're then they're not going to be able to separate the two? Well, I put myself. It's very hard to be objective when you see yourself in a film. Obviously, I think it's impossible to be to be fully objective. Um, however, I, I my biggest I guess fear is that with this film is that I might reject seeing myself play the character. And when I sat with Lars and we watched the film and he grabbed a hold of me and he said, you have to watch the film with me. And, and that didn't happen. I saw it, okay, that's a character. And of course, you know, I, it was a, sort of a... But I, I guess the, the fear is that if the film doesn't work, then you've just taken a big risk by, yeah. by doing something like this. But the film but works. But I've done that. I do take risks. Yeah, and the film works, and so I was very happy. Well, he's a great filmmaker. Yeah, the film works, and I think uh, as a fan of, his, of, of Lars's work, I would say it's, it's one, of his, one of his best movies. Mm. The first well, time you see it, and I think it's, like, it's unexpected because it's about a serial killer, and people are ex like, think he's going to take cheap shots, but not at all. It's actually like a work of high art that's really smart and really winky and funny, but at the same time is a very serious depiction of a serial killer. I think it's one mm. of the, the more honest depictions of a serial killer that, that I've ever seen, mm. like in line with like Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer in the 80s, you know? Yeah. Which uh, is a huge risk for an actor to take. Oh, I, absolutely. And, um, but I did it because I knew this guy was a filmmaker who pays attention and he's really, he's not gonna walk away from something. If it's not working, he's a committed filmmaker and with a vision. So, what do you mean walk away from something if it's not? Well, working? you know, you with, find uh, that's sometimes? that's the feeling I got. Like, so I have this sense of responsibility as an actor. I want to do it right. I want to. I'm professional. I want to get it right. You know, and 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 I want to. You know, and and I think a lot of us have that. And here I found myself in a situation where that wasn't so important. What was important was doing great work and, and, and finding something and discovery, really finding something. And the only way to do that is to take risks. And 
you can take risks when you trust the person you're working with. And he wouldn't walk away from a scene. I mean, there was one particular scene that we did in the film, which is the scene where he goes to the woman's house that was really fun. It was fun as an actor. And the following scenes, that whole sequence was a lot of fun to do. And, and then there was a later a scene where he's in the, the walk-in freezer. You're going to learn about the walk-in freezer when you see the movie. And he's in the walk-in freezer. And it's a movie about a serial killer, the walk-in and, freezer, yeah, guys. There you yeah. go, there you go. <laughs> And that scene was difficult for me, and it was a lot of dialogue. And later we were having dinner that night, and he said, you know, you had difficulty with that scene in the, in the freezer because it's, it's not a well-written scene, he said to me. Hmm. And he said, but it's going to be great in the movie, you know? And he said, just like you had a good time when you were doing the scene on the porch with selling, playing the cop, the insurance salesman, and that whole sequence. And he said, because those were well-written but they're going to be great in the movie too. It's going to be, so the feeling I get is that he really knows what he wants and he's, and, he, and he's paying attention. And so, that's also a way of it's so important, you know, for us it's to also, trust the director. Well, know? yeah, that's a way of validating your feeling as the actor as well, not sort of putting the burden entirely on your shoulders by him saying like, I didn't write a great scene, but don't worry, I will know how to edit it. Into it's something. Go, it's It'll going to be, be great in the movie. It's what I need. It serves its purpose. And so that's, I mean, that's really key. So if an actor trusts the director, we will go further. We will take more risks and take more chances. And, and that was the most important thing, that when we discussed this film, before we, we ventured into it, well, he had already written it, so, but before I went on this journey with him, it was all about trust. Do you feel like this is the uh, riskiest role, riskiest part you've ever done? Um, yes. Yes, because it's a film that explores, it's, I mean, it's a meditation on evil and it goes into dark places and uh, um, the darkest place. things <laughs> that we don't really understand about, disturbing things that we don't completely understand. And yet it's not as if this is some little tiny corner of the world. It's happening. It's stuff that happens in our lifetime and it's happening whether we, care to face it or not. And I think that in that way, it was risky. It felt like, well, what are we doing here? Where are we going? What are we exploring here? And um, that was exciting for me as an actor, as an artist, it was exciting for me. But also it's kind of scary because you just don't know. I mean, what if it doesn't work? And then you're out there with that, you know, in some way, or what if it's mis... It's, it is kind of scary, you know. That. Was it as scary as uh, directing and starring in your own movie? <laughs> That's a different kind of fear, you know. But, uh, you know, here's the thing. Working with someone, I benefited when I directed and acted in a film. That was, I think that's the question you're asking, is difficult to direct and act in something simultaneously. That did keep me up at night a little bit. And in a foreign country, your first movie, in a third world country at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I watched the movie recently. It's called City of Ghosts. He directed it. It's an, it's an incredible movie. And it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating to, to watch you do that, to take on... I mean, most people are like, oh, I'm going to direct my first movie. I'm an actor. It's going to be a little thing about people in L.A. <laughs> like, yeah, a little kitchen, kitchen sink drama. Yeah, yeah. where you're like, no, I'm going to do a noir in Cambodia. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it took a while to get it made. You know, it wasn't like something that happened overnight. It took took years really to get it made and it's something I'm very proud of I had a great experience doing it and uh, what was scary about that was that I was directing and playing the central character and in this particular case it was fine because the character was under a great deal of stress so it suited me fine because I was under a great deal of stress when I was making this. All the sweat was real and everything. Oh yeah well we, we yeah we didn't we didn't need to generate much fake sweat it was all there it was uh, yeah it was interesting but um but you know again um be it was a first time film for me as a director but i had made so many films and worked with so many filmmakers so i had a lot of experience in that respect you know was there a particular director that you had worked with prior to making that that you really sought the counsel of before making the film or you were thinking of when you made the movie um you know i spoke to francis coppola about it and he's, uh, you know, he was great. I mean, he's such a brilliant man, and his ideas, 
even when I didn't agree with him, they were like better than everybody else's ideas, you know? And he was really great. And he was very generous with like talking to me about it, reading this, reading several drafts of the script and was very, uh, you know, he's such a, and, he, and, he, and of course I feel always a debt of gratitude to Francis for, for, for help, what he's done for my career, you know, when I was a young actor, you know. And so, but he was somebody that, that was very supportive of me during that. Is there uh, the chance that you'll direct another movie? Well, I actually, I, I'm in the middle of a documentary that I'm directing, um, different than a fiction film. Yeah. Much harder. Documentaries are really difficult. Uh, I find them to be, um, they're more difficult than fiction. Because you're, you're writing the script in the editing room. I mean, you, yeah, you're writing it, you know, it's constantly changing. And, um, but it's fulfilling in a, an entirely different way. And it's a music-based documentary. I'm a music uh, lover. I love music. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a personal story, too. So A personal story for you? Well, it's, it's personal in that, you know, it, it spans, it's got depth of time. You know, it's, uh, the, some of the footage that I'm using in the film is film footage that I shot in 1999. So it was um, it was a Cuban scat singer from. Um, he was the first Cuban scat singer, who left Cuba in the '50s and moved to Mexico, and and lived there for 40 years. When we got, I went down there, <clears throat> and I heard his music and thought he was just phenomenal. And uh, I had a friend of mine who's a, a musician in L.A. who was always working with older, sort of forgotten artists. And I said, you know, you should find this guy. He's living in Mexico, and you should make a record with him. And uh, he did. And then he said, well, why don't you come down, you know, bring a camera, and you can film the making of the record. And I did. And so I had this miraculous, this remarkable experience of working, of being there. And, and, and this guy was 77 years old, so he was at a very late point in his life. But he still had it all. The music, he brought so much with him. But there was also the sense that, you know, he wasn't going to be doing this for much longer. And it was, turned out to be his last record. And then I retraced the footsteps of his life. And, um, and that was very interesting, too, because he was historically a very important guy. In a way, he came from an interesting tradition, music in Cuba, based on American jazz and, and things like that. And... Uh, but he was the guy who walked in the room that you're never going to forget. You know, he was his personality. He was a showman. He was a real, I don't know, he was this bigger-than-life personality. And so the film is that, and it's also a little bit of my journey into this, into this story. So it's, it's rich, and it's complex, and uh, I, I feel good about it, but it's not... It's not necessarily something that's been easy, you know. Yeah, well, I can't wait to, to see it. I yeah. can't wait to see it. Still working on it, so we'll, <laughs> hopefully we'll have something to show. Uh, I'm going to go to audience Q and A in a second, but you know, since I had when when we did that interview for you before, and uh, I kept bringing up something about Mary, I went back and rewatched it, and I have to say, your performance in something about Mary is like one of, the, and I'm not just saying this because you're on stage and I'm kissing your ass. It is one of the great comic performances. Wow. It Thank is you. so funny. All right, do you hear that? I want to get another comedy. <laughs> they don't cast me in comedies enough. I like doing. No, comedy. I'm serious. They don't. You are so funny in that movie, and you you own every line and every un PC thing that he says. You do it hilariously, oh, and you sell it wonderfully. What I mean that was kind of the first real comedy that you had done at that point, right? Um, or at least that broad. Yeah, I mean, I did a, the Flamingo Kid when I was younger. It was a comedy. I did that. It was the first one I did. And um, yeah, but that was really, well, those guys, the Fairley brothers were, you know, just brilliant with comedy and very funny. Did you audition for that or did they come to you? No, no, they came to me, wow. you know, they came to me with that. And uh, they, they like to work with both uh, serious actors. They like to put in their comedies, serious actors with comedic actors, put them together. And they they'd done that on Kingpin. That's how they did that with uh, with uh, Woody, Woody and, and 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 Randy Quaid, Dennis 
Randy, Randy Quaid. And also, uh, they did it with... Uh, Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels, yeah. yeah, right? And, and Jim Carrey. So, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, when they hit me with the teeth... <laughs> what's so funny? I still have those teeth, by the Do way. Do you really? I, I have them in a jar on the shelf. In my in my house, I have I've kept them. I mean, when you first show up with the teeth, you do this thing with your hands to sort of show in the doorway, and it was what it was. I I was like watching it at work downstairs, and I had headphones on. I was laughing hysterically just at your silly face with the teeth going like this. Well, I I thought you know once we did that scene, that would be it. And he said, no no no, you got the teeth for the rest of the movie. I said okay. <laughs> oh, that's the way we fly. That's the way we do it. That's the way we fairlies like to do it. Did you have to? Did you? Imp did you have to improvise at all on that movie, or was that just like the line? Well, yeah, line? we did a lot of improvisation, really? but I'll say though that they, as writers of the f of the script, Bob, Peter, and Bob Fairley, they were improvising too. So they would be like, "Hey, I got another line for you." We'd be in the middle of doing the take, and he'd throw something at me, and we'd just try different stuff all the time. And sometimes it, they would come up with some funny stuff, and I. I couldn't say it because it was so funny. It was like I couldn't keep a straight face, you know? Some of the stuff they would come up with. Yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from the audience. What do we got? Hi, Matt. Hi. Uh, my question is, do you keep in contact with any of your cast members from The Outsiders still? Um, yes, to a certain extent. You know, uh, I sometimes we'll see... Um, uh, I'll see, sometimes I'll see, talk to Tommy Howell, or, you know, it's funny, the, the two guys that I felt closest to in the movie were Ralph and Tommy, because our characters were together a lot in the film, and so we, I probably stayed, I felt more of a bond with those guys, you know, uh, just because of the way we, our filming schedules were, and we just connected, our characters were together a lot, yeah. Ralph just gave a great performance in the last season of The Deuce as a dirty cop. He's really good. He's great. Great actor and, and a phenomenal person, too. Yeah. Great human being. Uh, next question, right here. Hi, man. How are you doing? Um, I actually purchased the film already on uh, YouTube. It's actually available. So uh, the director's cut. And uh, what Oh, you could get the director's cut. Yeah. I you, didn't know you that. Can. <laughs> you, you can no? watch it? Yeah. I don't uh, know about that. I'm looking at somebody from IFC. They're shaking their head. No, it's, like, it's $13.99. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I saw the film already, and um, I just wanted to know if there was anything after filming uh, that maybe you had to come down from the role. Because I know, like, a lot of actors, like, recently, they've kind of been on trends in which they do, like, a very hard role to tackle because maybe the character's ideology is kind of, like, so out there and maybe offensive or whatnot. And they probably, after the film, they do something, whether it's therapy or they uh, find a method. I know Turfa Grace from Black Klansman, after he he played uh, the racist in that film. He actually said that he had to uh, put together the three Hobbit films together and made it in a two hour movie just so he can kind of like come down from it because it was just like so hard. So I just wanted to know if there was something you did after filming this because that I know. That was a movie he did after he did that, you're saying? No, no he, he oh. played David Duke in Black Klansman. And oh, apparently okay. To come down from feeling so awful about I see. David Duke, he watched The Hobbit. Oh, okay. He watched it, he didn't play one of them. No, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, well, you know, listen, this film definitely, there, there were, uh, I mean, I, without talking, so much, giving away too much of the film, there, were, there was one a sequence in the film that was very difficult for me. Uh, well, a couple were, actually, but um, it's funny because I worked with uh, Bruno Gans, a great actor, he plays Verge in the film, and he had played, probably done, an incredible performance as as Hitler. And I I kind of wanted to talk to him just a little bit about that because I was playing I'm playing somebody evil and he's playing somebody. And it was it was it was uh interesting because really, I mean, um I'm not Jack. You know what I mean? So there is a real distinction. So in doing it, I don't need to explore some other darker recesses, you know. Jack is Jack, I'm me. So, however, some of the stuff on some days were, were very difficult. The scene uh, with, with the 
Simple, played by Riley Keough, great actress. That was a difficult scene for me. Then there was a scene with the picnic, the family with the kids. That was really tough. And it was, those days were difficult for me. I went home and, uh, you know, it was very hard. hard. It wasn't the, di- the, the kids stuff, wasn't that shot over the course of like a few days too? All, all of the, so there's, in the film, there are five episodes and Jack sort of taking you through his, his life as a, a serial killer and he has five examples, five episodes that um, he uses to explain his, his whole story in life. And they all were like, like you said, they were done over five days because they weren't just one scene. They were sequences, you know. And, uh, of course, in the, the the filming of it, the toughest ones were done toward the end, you know, save the toughest for last. But, um, you know, it was... Cha- I like a challenge, but... Um, but they were... That was... That, that, that could be a little bit difficult. But I have to say... Yes, it was difficult material, but we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun making this film. I really liked Lars. I love the cameraman, the other actors. We, it was a creative experience, you know? I mean, it, it, there's no doubt about it. When I say fun, I don't mean that it was fun doing these, you know, playing a sadistic person, but the discovery that was happening, I mean, we we worked in a way I learned a lot. I came away from, and I'm I'm not talking about the content, the violent content of the movie. I'm talking about the process in, in the way that we worked. You know, um, no rehearsal, um, very loose. You know, um, freedom, a sense of freedom. And so, from an acting standpoint, it couldn't get any better than that for me, for the most part. There was only sometimes there was too much dialogue. Yeah, you said, you know, when I brought up something about Mary last time, you said it's fun to play a liar. And I imagine that it'd be pretty fun to play Jack because he's kind of always lying to yeah. everybody and himself. So there's always kind of a wink that you get to have there as the actor that would allow you to have some distance between the character and mm-hmm. yourself, I imagine. Yes, yes. I, and I totally agree. It is fun to play somebody who's holding some other secret or an alternative truth, right, that he has, right? Um, and, but it was interesting with Lars because there were times when I felt like Jack might be lying in plain sight, for example. There's a scene where he, he basically confesses to a policeman that, yeah, I am a serial killer and I've killed all these people. And on top of all that, I've been a very bad boyfriend to that girl. <laughs> and it's all true. But in my mind, my first impression was, this is a lie. He's doing this, like, to be sarcastic. Yeah, I'm a serial killer. Yeah, yeah. But in fact, Lars's direction, which was right on, was that this is Jack wants to get caught. He's confessing. He really is truly confessing. Yeah. He wants to be caught. And, and that was... That was interesting to play somebody, and you can see the unraveling of, of who he as as the 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 more the mania escalates within him, the the more careless he gets in his. Uh, one more question from the hi hi I'm Sarah. Um, my question is, what was your favorite movie to film, and who were your favorite cast members while filming it? Wow, well, there's a lot. (laughs) Um, You know what? We have a tendency to do this, I must admit. Mm -hmm. When the experience is good, the memories all of a sudden look really good in the rearview mirror. It's true. When the film film comes out and you're kind of happy that, you know, all that hard work paid off, everything, you start to forget the fact that you weren't getting along with this one and this was a problem and everybody got sick and this happened and that. You just kind of remember the good stuff. But, I, you know, I had some great experiences. I liked being in um, Cambodia when I wrote and directed that film, City of Ghosts, back in 2002, I think, 2001. And 2002, I think. And uh, that was great. And the feeling I had there as, a, as, a, as an actor, director, um, was I, had a, I have a special bond with those actors who came on that journey with me. So I have a 
you know, real love for Stellan Skarsgård, who's a Lars von Trier veteran who's worked on many of his films because I acted with him and directed him in that. So, and, and Natasha McElhone, who was in that, went along with me on that journey. So I, I feel a special bond with actors like that. I remember, you know, uh, I've worked with some great actors uh, um, way back, and I did a movie, Flamingo Kid. I stayed friends with a lot of those cast members over the years. And, um, and, uh, and that's not that common. You know, often you do a film and everybody goes their own way. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you maybe see each other if you work together again. Mm-hmm. But on that film, we made a lot of fr- I made a lot of friends and stayed friends, you know. Uh, one of my favorite films of yours is Drugstore Cowboy. Uh, mm. it's oh, Gus that was a lot of fun up in Oregon. Was yeah. it really? Yeah. Well, it's Gus Van Sant's second movie, right? right. Or like, after Malanoche, which is like a fairly low budget uh, film about um, teenagers around Oregon. And I'm curious if you knew while you were shooting it, if you were seeing dailies, that you were going to be making something that was. It's kind of an iconic movie now, especially when it comes to independent film and American independent film. Well, you know, what I remember about Drugstore Cowboy before we did it, um, it was right around, it was Ronald Reagan, who was still president, the end, I think. Right, the movie came out in 90, 91? Yeah, and when we were making it, it was Just Say No. That was the big campaign, Just Say No. And we were making a film that was, like, authentic. It was about, it was written by a guy who was serving time in prison for robbing drugstores and pharmacies. So those people were all based on real people. Uh, people don't too. take drugs like that because it's an unpleasant experience. But uh, interestingly enough, anytime you saw a film about drug addiction, up until then, it was very like, it was this horrible, painful thing. And the way Gus made the film was that, you know, drugs, there was the, uh, why do people take drugs? There was an element of the euphoria that was there. And that was considered like kind of taboo after that to show people intravenously taking drugs and that kind of thing. And it changed after that because then film started to actually address that part of it, that it wasn't a taboo thing. To really show it, you have to show both sides of it, you know. And so, you know, that was, uh, that was the environment. I remember there were people going, I can't believe you're going to make a movie like this because it wasn't a conventional depiction at that time. It was so fascinating because yeah. that's not what I think people talk about at all when they talk about that movie anymore. You know, they talk about the filmmaking and the performance and the obsession with uh, superstition and then, and, you know, and William Burroughs. And yeah, they well. get past that yeah, exactly. and they accept the reality of those characters. You know, they're not running around robbing drugstores and taking drugs because, because they don't feel an urge to do that. It's not like some, you know what I mean? And, and it was a sad movie. No, no, it's not like, oh, my, you know, and, well, yeah, it's, it's a, and it's a very specific point of view, but it was very real. Those people really existed. It's not a nonfiction story, but it's, all those characters really existed. Well, what was it like doing the, last question, I got, I know I got to let you go. What was it last, like doing those scenes with Burroughs? He was, Priest. uh, Burroughs, yeah. William Burroughs? Well, he was great. I mean, he was, uh. I'd say that it's a unique, you know, there's certain kind of, certain performers like, you know, William S. Burroughs is like, he's not a performer, but he's a, a, a character. And yeah, he is a performer. because plays he, up his character. Well, yeah. if you hear some of his, um, his, his poetry readings and stuff on tape, he is quite a performer. And he was very authentic. So when he comes on the screen, he just grabs your attention. Um... Matt, thanks so much for coming in, man. The House That Jack Built is a great movie. I think it's an amazing performance Nobody, by you. No animals or human yes. beings were harmed during the making of the movie. You should know that while watching it. <laughs> you can have a little more fun while you watch it because you know that now. Uh, it opens uh, this week, the 14th, I think, uh, on demand and in theaters. Everybody give a big round of applause to the great Matt Dillon. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs>